Born in Cleveland, raised a hillbilly. What's your story? Welcome to the Hillbilly Justice on the School Bus podcast. Here's your host, Sarah Blossom Ware. Welcome to the Hillbilly Justice on the School Bus podcast. I'm Sarah Blossom Ware. The chapter that I will read today is called Granny. From the ages of three to five years old, my world consisted primarily of my parents, my brother George, an occasional neighbor, goats, chickens, my whippet dog Bonzo, mud puddles, and woodpiles. When I was five years old, my world became much bigger when I was introduced to Granny, my new babysitter, and Granny's vast extended family along with her. Granny lived on the adjacent mountain to ours, Blue Mountain, also known as Kelly Mountain, just across the blacktop. Granny was related to everyone, whether by blood or otherwise. She was greeted as Granny, Mom, or Aunt Ollie by everyone who walked through her door. I have never known so many people in one family to have names, starting with the letter O. Granny was Ollie. She had a brother named Ani, a son named Olin, and a daughter named Oma. Granny had seven children in all, from oldest to youngest, C.L., Lillian, Oma, L.V., Norma, pronounced Normie, Rue, and Olin. As a child, I had the most interactions with Olin, L.V., and Rue. Oma lived in Oklahoma. We called her Oma from Oklahoma. But everyone else lived within close proximity. Norma and L.V. lived on the far side of Kelly Mountain. Rue lived with Granny and Olin lived just up the hill about a hundred yards above her. Olin had four children, Crystal, Lisa, Corey, and Josh. Corey was my age and Josh was George's age, so that was perfect for playing. And so the lives of the Kuhariks and the Vickeries were intermingled. Although Granny's heritage is undocumented, Granny claimed to be one quarter Black Dutch, which in this case is a Cherokee descent. Regardless of the lack of documentation, Granny looked 100% like an old Indian princess. She had long, blackish-gray hair that flowed down to her calves, but the only time we saw its length was when she briefly unpinned it to rewrap her bun. Granny always wore a modest, short-sleeved, one-piece dress that reached down to her ankles. Granny Vickery was very much like Granny Clampett from the Beverly Hillbillies in stature, spunk, and shrilling voice. Granny lived her entire life as we knew it within the confines of her humble home, namely sitting in her rocking chair in the living room. When we weren't playing outside, we were watching TV. Every day at noon, Granny would announce, You kids, quit your scuffling. My stories are fixing to come on. Granny's stories were her daytime soaps. They would start with All My Children, then One Life to Live, and then General Hospital. My favorite characters were Erica Kane, Tad Martin, and Luke and Laura Spencer, respectively. Granny always put full effort into everything she set out to do. Colossians 3.23 And whatever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not unto men. Long before we met Granny, she had worked for 33 years, peeling tomatoes for three cents, a 14-quart bucket, at the Kelly Canning Company. Granny often f- referred fondly to the Cannon Company. At a reunion of employees in 1985, Granny was presented with an award for number one woman worker. I'm sure she was. I never saw her peel tomatoes, but I did see her pick blueberries. Some fun summer days, someone would arrive at Granny's house and load us up in the bed of a pickup truck and take us into Farmington, about 20 minutes away, to pick blueberries. It is not as easy as it sounds. It would take me about half an hour to fill one bucket, and the contents had much to be desired, with stems and green berries. Granny was super fast at filling those buckets, and her berries were beautiful. She had a special technique using her thumb to roll the berries off of the plants and into the buckets without any of the stems. Granny was also exceptionally good at quilting. Granny had an electric sewing machine and she was just as handy with that as she was at peeling tomatoes and picking blueberries. 
She would transform piles of old clothing and other materials into beautiful quilted masterpieces. Some of the quilts had very intricate designs. My favorite design was the basket pattern, but I also liked her star pattern a lot. Granny had a tacking frame that hung from the ceiling of her living room. This was a rectangular shape made out of four sets of two small boards. When Granny needed to tack out a quilt, she would unwind the twine at the corners of the frame to lower it from the ceiling until it came down to about waist high. Then she would secure a sewn quilt onto the frame by sandwiching the edge, edges in between the two sets of boards. Granny let us help her tack out the quilts. We would stand underneath the frame and loop short pieces of yarn through the center of the quilt squares with a large needle and then tie them off with simple knots. Okay, so um, we're here again with some discussion panel members and I would like for them to take just a minute and introduce themselves with their six word summaries. Hello again, this is Laura Valcour and I am the Energizer Bunny Chef Instructor and Perpetual Student. Hi, this is Cynthia Kramer. I'm the mother, bassoonist, and environmentalist. Hey, thank you very much for joining us again today. Um, this will be the last podcast that we'll, you will both be here. So I want to again just say thank you very much for um, being with us for these podcasts. Um, so I, I like to do this segment called, So What Have You Been Busy With Lately? But you both already participated in that. And so what I would like to do in place of that today is um, talk about bucket list items. Oh, I haven't <laughs> thought of that one. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll go ahead and start, and then you guys can maybe be thinking about it. So bucket list items in what have you done already, and what do you still plan to do um, that are on that bucket list? So... Um, Something that I recently did that has been on my bucket list for the past two years is I got African braids in my hair. So for the past two years, I've been telling all of my students in my classes, you know, this is my next bucket list item. This is my next bucket list item. But now I've, I've done it. So um, the next item on my bucket list is to get a tattoo. <laughs> Oh, oh, here she goes. But I am a microbiologist and I am extremely not um, happy with the thought of someone poking needles into my skin. <laughs> so we'll see how long it takes to get this one done. Um, if I find someone I trust or not, that's kind of the main thing. But uh, what about you guys? Well, let's see. So uh, one thing I had on my uh, bucket list was to play bassoon in a bar or play bassoon in a, <laughs> in a, in a rock band. And um, I went ahead and was able to do that. <laughs> so maybe about eight, nine years ago, I would go to open mics and I'd look for somebody that might be receptive to this idea. And there was a couple uh, that played guitar and sang and they said, oh, sure not thinking I'd really show up, but I did. I showed up with my bassoon and I was ready to jam. And then another guy came to the concert. He saw me and he was like, that's the one. That's who I need for my band. So then we had a band and we he would sing and play guitar and I'd play bassoon and, and do like hand drumming and things like that. And we did kind of a comedy act and it was really fun. So. You know, that was one of my goals and, and I accomplished it. Um, I have so many goals. <laughs> that's, that's kind of my problem is I have all these ideas. I think one thing that keeps coming back that I think I'd like to do is I'd like to write a musical based on my grandpa in World War II. Cool. So <laughs> that's a bit of a, a feat because you have to write the story, write the music. Um, but I do have my whole life to do it and there's no deadline. So that's, uh, that's what I've been thinking about. That's a lofty 
bucket list item. But you did the first one, which but was I also did the pretty lofty. One, so. so, all right, cool. Yeah. So, how about you, Laura? Well, I have a fun one, but I also have um, my degree in nutrition that I'm looking to finish, and I think I will graduate after my children. <laughs> But that's quite all right. They're very proud of their mom. Um, I also want to write a, a cookbook uh, for children. And and it's been in the process now for about 20 years. <laughs> so it will come through uh, at some point. But I'm, I'm still uh, finishing a few other things right now. Yeah, you'd be perfect to write a kid's cookbook. That's what you do. I know. Lots of pictures, though. Lots of pictures. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. All right, let's talk about my granny. <laughs> <laughs> She's a character. My granny was like, a very unique, larger-than-life character. And when you, if you've met granny once, you remember granny. She was one of these kind of people. And so I'm wondering, do you know someone who is like that, who is just this larger than life, really interesting, unique character? I have an aunt, um, same, same type of, of feeling. Um, she is everyone's mother and she is not the youngest in the family, but she pretty much took care of her siblings single-handedly and that goes from you know just being warm and caring and and cooking and doing all of the the daily household things with them but also reprimanding them you know and she is, has taken care of I think of numerous grandchildren she's had a job um, doing furniture uh, wallpaper in a wallpaper manufacturing plant for a number of years and she had three children um, what I love most about her is her sponta spontaneity, and, and she is just very fun-loving. She tells you exactly what she's thinking, and her one of her famous lines is, uh, I just tell it like it is. <laughs> so I took her for her 40th birthday to Walt Disney World. She That was on her bucket list, and um, we had the best time, the two of us together, and she was like a little child in a, you know, in a candy shop. She stood in line with all the characters and took pictures with them. <laughs> she, um, but she, so she never believed in credit cards either. And so she, um, we went to the park and we had to drop off. She had to buy for all of her grandchildren a souvenir. And so we're at the park and we're at the lockers. And I remember standing there waiting and waiting. And finally I went in to say, well, you know, what are you doing? I have to get my money ready. And I said, well, where is it? And she's digging around on the side of her clothes. And I, I'm, I'm looking at her. There's no purse. And all of a sudden I looked down. Do you know what she had? She had a crown royal bag with her money in it, safety pin to her underwear. <laughs> <laughs> She, we had to keep going back to get more money so that she could go buy more souvenirs. Oh my gosh, it was unbelievable. So this is my aunt, and I she is just a dear. I love her, um, but she is quite the character. <laughs> <laughs> well, you obviously love her. You took her to Disney World. That's right? just one story too. <laughs> okay, um, how about you, Cynthia? Well, I'm gonna go back to my grandpa, the bomber pilot. Um, after the war, he took uh, grandma to get some dental work done, and it cost a hundred dollars. And after that, he decided he was going to become a dentist. But his English wasn't very good since he grew up speaking Polish. So he had to go back and study English um, and pass some sort of English proficiency. Um, and then he was able to go to St. Louis University and get a dental degree. Um, and he had completed that when he was 35. And he worked as a dentist and he was very generous. Uh, family members, police, clergy, uh, they could all have dental work for free. Um, and if you couldn't pay for dental work, he'd accept like produce from farmers and things like that. Um, and I just, I don't know, it just warms my heart. Every little bit I learn about my grandpa um, just makes me 
it just the depth of his his character um, from his time in the war and then like to his time with us um, because uh, when I was born, Grandpa said to Grandma, "Let's move to Florida," and Grandma said. That's fine, but I'm moving to Naperville, where my <laughs> granddaughter is. So then Grandpa spent the rest of his life in Naperville. And uh, when he passed away, when people came that didn't even really know, they just knew him as, like, that funny guy that was at the Y, you know, the guy that would come in early and throw his cane over his lane before swimming. So he really affected a lot of people just kind of with his personality. Yeah, you, he's obviously been very influential in your life. You he has. talked about him a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Neat. I like to tie things in, too. Right. Oh, yeah, you're, you're good great. at that. <laughs> you're good at that. <laughs> this is helpful for me. <laughs> okay, so my granny, um, she did not have formal education, even grade school, really, education. Um, she could read. She, you know, read a lot from her Bible. She could write, but her writing was like her own, like only she could read it. You know, it was like her own characters. Um, so, you know, not a lot of formal education. I, I believe her parents um, moved around and harvested, you know, and did some farming kind of a um, kind of migrant work. Um, but she was a very intelligent woman. And she made a lot of sense. You know, she was very logical. Um, so I'm wondering if you can describe someone that you know who, I mean, definitely is not, it's not implying anything like stupidity or something like this, but just someone who maybe didn't have much formal education, but is obviously intelligent and you respect, you know, things that they say, for example. I have a wonderful mother-in-law and um, grew up on the farm in the north. It's called the Northeast Kingdom in Vermont. And so they, to get to the, the closest store, they would have to, they would only go once a, a week. And, you know, they drive the tractor down and, and get what they need and came back. Everything else is produced there on the farm. And so in a very, very large family, she was one of the middle children and stayed at home to help with the farm. So her education was a one-room schoolhouse, and I think she made it to eighth grade. I'm not exactly sure there, but I do know this. She writes prolifically. She is she writes poetry and short stories. She hasn't been published yet, though we keep encouraging her to write. But I think what strikes me most about her is her patience and her gentle, caring nature. And also that she um, she is very wise. Um, so I will call her if I have a situation I want to deal with, and I really respect her opinion. Um, one little note is that she decided for herself that she wanted to finish her uh, um, education, and so she actually went back to college and got her associate's degree at age 55. Oh, good for her. So That's she's, great. Mm -hmm. She's quite an amazing woman. Yeah, that's a I guess a good word too for my granny was a lot of wisdom. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a good word. Yeah. Cynthia? Well, keeping with the granny theme, <laughs> I decided for this question I'd pick my grandma, who was married to Grandpa the Bomber <laughs> Pilot. Her name was Wanda and his plane was called Wondrous Wanda. So if you do Google that you'll see a picture of plane art with Wondrous Wanda of an <laughs> depiction of, of my grandma. Um, I don't think she ever went to college. Um, you know, she, her parents came over from Poland. Uh, she and her family ran a grocery store. And, you know, she raised my dad while grandpa was at war with, you know, her mom. And then after grandpa became a dentist, she worked as his receptionist and hygienist. So she, like, picked up all the other stuff. Um, and then she was, you know, very good at quilts and Afghan. I mean, she made wonderful Afghans, quilts, clothes. Um, and she also had this special knack for 
entering contests with like colored envelopes and stuff so that she would win things so she won a car for my dad find crystal oh my for my parents and she won this like totally awesome swing set for us so like you know as i said she wasn't let's say an academic but she definitely was was very smart knew what she liked to do and worked very hard and was a great grandma you know? oh very That's nice sweet. yeah I love my grandmas, too, (laughs) and my granny. (laughs) So, yeah, my my granny was, you know, she was somebody else's grandma. But, you know, but she's my granny. I spent um, way more time with her than my grandparents, not by choice. They're just in Ohio. Um, But, yeah, really, grandmas, grannies, whatevers, you know, great aunts, they they can be really, really great for, for kids, you know. I wish my kids were around they're even my great grandma's more you know in ohio so um okay um we're sticking with granny because this chapter is called granny um we have more granny chapters on the way too but (laughs) so there's a lot to talk about with granny um but she let us help her tack out her quilts and i remember as a child i loved that task it was to me it was a big responsibility even though it was just taking some thread going up, you know, through the the quilt on the bottom and then tying it off at the top. It's a very simple task and I understand why she let us do it because kids can do that. But to me at the time, and even now when I think about it, it, it's kind of gives me a lot of pride because she let us do that. She, um, you know, to me, it was a, a big responsibility to get it right in the center of the square, you know, or whatever. I don't know. Um, but so I'm wondering if you can describe a time when an adult let you help out on and maybe an adult project when you were younger, what kind of feelings do you have around that? And what kind of memories do you have around that? I have uh, a great memory that really, I think, boosted my interest in uh, becoming a a chef. And my uncle uh, lived with my grandmother for many years. And um, for his career, though, he chose to be a chef as well. And he became a sous chef at the Boca Raton Country Club, which was pretty posh for for. for all of us, because we had never tried Vichy Soir or, you know, any of these, you know, really um, gourmet type items. And when he would come home, I would help him. He would allow me to help him in the kitchen. And we created some pretty amazing meals for the holidays for the family. I remember one in particular being a, um, it was a headdress of an Indian made from all of the vegetables and the um cold uh, meats that we had and cheeses and the face we had to mold it out of sweet potatoes to look like the Indian and it was I wish I had a picture of it to me it was so authentic and so we did um, quite a few things together and for him to allow me you know as a 10 year old 12 year old to help him that was pretty pretty cool Thanks. That sounds yeah, that wonderful. Is cool. Yeah, and delicious. It yes. Was. Yeah. <laughs> All of the above. Well, I went on with the quilting theme. Um, so my maternal grandma. So this is another grandma. Her name uh, was Emily. Uh, she she was a librarian like me, and uh, she had a quilt and she was embroidering the squares for it. Um, But there were many squares, and she'd done about half of them. And then she showed me how to do the embroidery, and I finished it. She kind of gave me some suggestions, and I finished the quilt. And I just felt, I was about 12 at the time, and I just felt really accomplished that there was this quilt that we had made together, um, and that I'd actually been able to put together a quilt. So, um you know, she has since passed away, but I still have the quilt and I have the memories of her and I'm following her footsteps career-wise. So that's another good thing. Yeah, nice. Quilting is, is really an art. I mean, it's not easy. No. I, it's not easy for sure. I'd made some kind of a small attempt at it when I was younger and it was a disaster. <laughs> but, but yeah, people who know how to do it, I mean, it's just, 
like a masterpiece when it's finished. Sewing is not easy. I remember no. sewing for my father, and I, he had me try to um, stitch his trousers for him. <laughs> I sewed the front to the back. Oh. <laughs> we didn't know until I tried to put them on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that and of course, good. I backstitched it so you couldn't get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one that maybe you um, you weren't allowed to help with that, uh, next time. That was the last one. <laughs> that was not my career choice. Thank goodness. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. Well, that's um, yeah. Thank you very much for for joining me again. Like I said, um, this pretty much wraps it up for. For my first granny chapter anyway but i do want to go ahead and again give you both the opportunity to you know say something what do you want to say you know and um, go ahead and uh, something say profound it. here no. oh where's your, where's your wisdom notes you i brought my wisdom notes <laughs> i'm the, trying to tie it in as you okay so, here's a time it. where you don't have to tie it in impart mm. some wisdom from your wisdom notes Okay, so I have so many in my file that I've been keeping, but this is one of my favorites. So it's uh, George Bernard Shaw, and it is, life is, isn't about finding yourself. Life is about creating yourself. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, I that's, like that that's a wonderful quote. Yeah, for sure. I have a few more, but. Let's hear another one. Yeah, hear I'm, another I'm, a, one. I'm game. <laughs> Hmm. Okay. I have so many. How about this one? This is anonymous. No matter what you say, it's your actions that speak for you. True. How about that? Very true. Yeah. Just the mindfulness. Right. The mm -hmm. mindfulness of what you do and the significance of it, as really is expressed by all these these stories. I mean, it's it's what happened. It's the events that created the memory, and then there's the person behind it that, that drove the event. Um, and for us, for me, a lot of times it was it was family members. But of course, not just family members can touch your lives, friends and um, co-workers or colleagues. So it's kind of nice to, uh, refreshing to have a, a book um, like hillbilly justice to <laughs> kind of bring you back down to earth, you know, help you rethink about what's important um, in your life and to reflect on happy, happy moments or times when you learned something and something you learned about human nature. This is true. Thank you, uh, Sarah, for sharing that. It's, yeah, you're very welcome. Yeah, yeah, it touched me on a lot of levels. And I found the humor just infectious. I think you... <laughs> humor <laughs> is wonderful. I've said before, but um, my mother has said, told me, you know, if I were telling these stories, they would not be as funny as <laughs> these, you know. <laughs> but so she, if she, and I can imagine, you know, when you're a kid, you you're a kid but you know their lives were hard you know really yes. i mean i kind of downplay it but it was a it was a hard life a physical life you mm -hmm. know even just daily chores with no running water no electricity and things like that you know but something that i really enjoy about this podcast is that i can ask such a simple question like what's your earliest memory of something beautiful in nature and magic happens that's that's really fun for me yeah and you took yeah. us back that's the best right. part isn't so, it to some good places right <laughs> great perfect <laughs> all right thank you so much for listening to the hillbilly justice on the school bus podcast tune in next time to hear about hillbilly communication until then dream big and have fun mm -hmm.